Many thanks, John, uh, and, and all our speakers, Noreen and Matt. Uh, we've got 10 minutes for some Q&A. We've, um, we, uh, we've got some questions coming through on, the, on, the, on our iPad. Um, one question uh, which I'll lead on to, because I, I, I'll, <coughs> from here, and, and I'll start off by asking it to Matt. Um, Matt, you and John actually really emphasize the importance of um, a really sort of rigorous, rigorous assessment. Are, are, we, are we leveled up across the country with respect to the depth and quantity of pathological assessment and diagnosis? And if not, how can clinicians persuade NHS health boards to fund molecular tumour boards to standardise that aspect of care? Well, kind of a, a yes and no answer. Um, I can only speak across England because it does vary across the devolved nations. But certainly in England, the testing for the targets which I listed in my slides is funded for everybody. There is a lot of flexibility in terms of how that's delivered. So some genomic laboratories will go for very small panels. Some of them will go for very large panels. They'll have different approaches in how they do that. Um, I do think that there does need to be more consistency, and I don't think that consistency comes from funding alone and just saying the testing is available. I think NHSE probably does need to come down and specify a little bit more exactly which panels ought to be being used. Yep. And, and I completely agree with that. Having said that, the, the UK system of, of centralised testing in seven places through the country is light years ahead of the rest of the world. I mean, it, 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 this, is, this is where um, somewhat incredibly we do, we do amazingly better than pretty much anybody else. If you come from the continent, if you're in the States, you get whatever test uh, your, your doctor writes on the form, and that can be one of multiple different tests and, it can, and of, of different qualities with different meanings. I mean, it's, it's, it's a real mess. Um, and so this, this, the centralized system of having your test and specific things tested uh, in, in centers is actually, I, I, think, I think, one of the one, a tremendous achievement, actually. Yeah. I can, uh, I'd, I'd second that as well. I mean, I'm involved in various sort of position papers that we're putting together in Europe about access to genomic testing. And it, and it really strikes me, as you hear colleagues uh, you know, from other parts of the world, there, there's such variation in terms of quality and equity in accessing what we now consider routine um, testing. To the point about molecular tumour boards, I do think we need uh, probably to develop a better framework because I think it's pretty patchy. Uh, and again, with ESMO, um, we're looking at a position paper for all of Europe on what an MTB function is, who should be discussed, how they should be configured, and what some of the KPIs should be around them. Thank you. Um, any questions from the floor? Yes. John or Noreen, who wants to take John, take? you go. Um, so, so first of all, the, um, d d us oncologists, when we have something that's working, uh, we're terribly reluctant to stop it. Um, because, and, and the principle always is, it may not be the right principle, but the principle always is to get the most out of what's working that you can. Having said that, you are absolutely correct. You know, some of this targeted stuff works way better than chemo. Why dither? Why, why, why not change? It comes down to him, actually. It comes down to, it comes down to how long it takes to get the testing done. So the, there have been now three studies, and the, the third one has finally folded, of where people were given targeted FGFR2 targeted drugs first 
before chemotherapy. And it's folded primarily because uh, the, other, the other two folded you know, like ages ago. Um, and the third one, uh, Juan has just told me, uh, is, 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 is about to fold completely predictably. Um, because it's taken, uh, it takes too long to get the result. And, and so, I mean, four to six weeks, uh, nobody can wait four to six weeks for treatment. Uh, yeah, so I'm super supportive of liquid biopsies, as you've seen. Um, but I, I think Matt made a really important point earlier that it's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all. So, for instance, in an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, if my liquid biopsy doesn't show an FGFR2 fusion, you know, I'm quite a sceptical oncologist. Is that true? You know, if I were to test on tissue... Um, would would I find that fusion? So I think there are instances where you, you definitely don't want to miss a target, and there I would be tempted to actually test on the tissue as well in addition to my liquid um, biopsy. So I think it's, you know, the context, the patient, the type of uh, cholangiocarcinoma that helps decision-making. And I think worth mentioning as well, um, obviously we need these results very quickly, as, as John mentioned. I think that emphasizes the need for pathologists to request these tests as soon as they make the diagnosis and to take the view that the diagnosis doesn't end at the point that you say cholangiocarcinoma. There's also molecular profiling, which is now part of the diagnosis because then it's there, it's ready for when it's needed. If it fails, you've got time potentially to do things, acquire more tissue, whatever you might need to do. It just means that you're not rushing when that information is desperately needed. Um. Juan Valle. Thank you. Um, part of what we need to do as a community is to be ready for the future. So we've had HER2 targeted therapies for breast cancer, gastric cancer. You know, it's just around the corner now for, for biliary tract cancer. Uh, I don't know, maybe you can talk a little bit about what we're going to do about HER2 testing, because it can be done on the gene, it can be done on the immunohistochemistry, the implications for sample flow, uh, and the availability of tissue. And that's a lot wrapped up in one question. Well, I can speak to the point about HER2 testing specifically. Um, testing for copy number variants is notoriously difficult with NGS, um, which is a real pain because the alternatives are also quite tricky. You know, the alternative would be to do fish, which means somebody's sitting at a microscope for probably 30 minutes a case, looking at each of them in turn. It takes a long time and it really limits what you can deliver. But then at the same time, you know, the alternative would be NGS, which gets rid of that problem. But depending on the assay you use, depending on the chemistry, that may not necessarily always give you absolutely crystal clear results. I think the jury's out. We all want to do it by NGS. Me, I'm a little bit of a skeptic at the moment. I'm not quite to the point where uh, I think it's entirely fit for purpose in all cases. I, I completely agree with that. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the HER2 data shows that actually immunohistochemistry is probably the best predictor of outcomes. So, um, so the NGS needs to get better. It does. I agree. I mean, so in the colorectal paradigm, actually, if you find your HER2 amplification, your copy number variant uh, increase on NGS, um, that patient's likely to respond very well to HER2 targeted therapy. But patient, where you don't find it, you also see some response because it, they're actually positive. They're not positive on NGS, but they're positive on tissue. Mm. So it is, I think, for every patient you see, it's that kind of bespoke um, thinking, using the tools in the, be the best way. But I completely agree with your point about line of sight. And I think in the NHS and in most healthcare systems, it doesn't happen, but it should do, because actually, ultimately, it would be much more efficient to think, what, what's coming down the line? What do we need to be ready to test for? And, you know, sorry to say this, Max, it burdens uh, the laboratories, but I, I'm a great fan of reflex testing, and I think many of us are really pushing for that to be done in our centres. But actually, across the country, we should probably push for that because ultimately we know there'll be an efficiency in the system and it's better for patients. But there's always this burden of proof that we have to get to to convince the, 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 the payer. I mean, just, just to finish off on a slightly cynical note, I mean, it, it, I, think it, I think it all actually does come down to the funding of the GLHs, um, per se, the, and, and the new histology centres. Um, actually, the recommendation for 
for uh, reflex HER2 immunohistochemistry went out to the GLHs and the uh, his, his, um, histology centers last summer. Mm. Um, uh, it's going to, I can't see that routinely happening for a little bit. No. It's, no. it's just, they just haven't got the resource, the funding, the people, the, 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 the processes in place to, to get all that running. I, I, uh, I agree. I think, um, I mean, as you mentioned earlier, I think having these seven consolidated hubs across England gives unparalleled access of testing, but it's also meant that those poor seven hubs have been absolutely inundated with work, and it makes it very difficult not only to deliver what they're trying to deliver already and what is established, it makes it even more difficult to bring in the next batch of tests. I just want to try and squeeze in one more question uh, that's just come through on the, on the iPad. Um, would molecular profiling be suitable for someone with carcinoma of unknown primary but suspected cholangio? Um, Noreen, do you want to kick off with that yeah, one? Yeah, I, I, definitely, I think. I mean, I think Manchester are leading in this field in terms of CUP and liquid biopsies uh, and GS. Um, but, you know, in, in practice, we have seen it make a difference. I've struggled and, in fact, you know, I've sent some cases to John for a second opinion on, you know, is this a CUP? Is this an intrahepatic cholangia carcinoma? We do the genomics. And to Matt's point about precision diagnostics, we found an FGFR2 um, aberration, we found an IDH mutation, and that's clinched it for us. I think CUP is the diagnosis which cries out for genomic testing, and especially for very broad panel NGS, not just to get patients on the right treatments, but to help you to get a pointer in the direction of the diagnosis. We know that if something looks like it's going to be a CUP initially, before you even look down the microscope, the odds are it's likely still to be some degree of CUP, even by the time you've done all the immunohistochemistry. So I've got to say, my view with these things is to get the panel started right away and request the tests to help to refine the diagnosis at the same time. Okay. Sorry, we did say that was the last one, but we have got one more, so we lied. Um, is there a correlation between a specific gene mutation and a recurrence of cholangiocarcinoma? Not that I know. Don't know of any. I don't. I, I don't know of any. What? I don't or, know. Or, or maybe to add to that question, uh, is there a, a link between actionable mutations and the underlying presence or absence of risk factors? Those. Yeah. Okay. So to answer that in a slightly different way, um, if you have an FGFR2, um, is that a is that a even without the treatment, I mean, you, you definitely get treatment today, but without the treatment, would you have done better or worse? And the answer is probably about the same. Probably about the same. So, so these lesions don't appear to predict for you doing well or badly. As, as, of, as, of, as of today's knowledge. Okay, we've come to the end of the session. Um, Helen, your thoughts on closing? Well, I think, I think this is, you know, the whole of this afternoon has really set the scene for, for what we have coming up tomorrow. This has been, you know, this is supposed to be meant for our patients and carers, but I think this has been extremely high level. And we've had some, you know, pretty good explanations of things. You have brought it down so that we can understand things, uh, which I thank you for myself. Um, but I found the whole of this afternoon really fascinating, from the microbiome talks, the, the, um, you know, the, the pathology, the, the liquid biopsy, and, and the molecular profiling and targeted therapies, which is really of the moment, isn't it? This is what we're about. This is the, um, you know, the theme of, of this conference, which is, is sort of, accelerating progress and that's really what we've been pushing forward to this afternoon so I thank you hugely for to all of our speakers today and not forgetting Andy as well for his 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 explanation of why but why we all do what we do because we're trying to improve that situation I would just remind you that we've got the meat and mingle buffet but you are free um, until half past six when that happens in the pre-function room 
um, but, but do continue networking, continue speaking with each other, and look at your, your program and get set up for an exciting day tomorrow. So thank you very much, everyone.